Valentine's Day. I signed the two of us up for paradise and myself up for hero, Tracy said, sitting down across from me. I took a sip of bourbon and nodded my head. I was still trying to thaw out after the two-block walk from Gibson's to Division Street. The temperature had reached five degrees, but the cold wind made it feel like minus two degrees outside. I took Tracy out for a romantic Valentine's Day dinner. When Tracy saw that I was inviting her to karaoke after dinner, she jumped in her seat and clapped her hands with delight. Tracy loved singing in public. Damn Chicago winters, I thought for the millionth time. The Dive on Division Bar opened just a month ago and has been hosting karaoke nights on Thursdays. We visited the bar for the first time on Thursday, though we've stopped by a couple times since the grand opening. Division Street in Chicago's Gold Coast neighborhood has long been one of Chicago's busiest streets. It was home to bars and the occasional restaurant, but it truly blossomed after the pandemic ended. It was a lively alternative to the Viagra Triangle, the stretch of the Gold Coast where State Street, Wabash Avenue, and Rush Street converge, and long dominated by such notable establishments as Gibson's Steakhouse and Hugo's Frog Bar. The Dive on Division establishment has gone through several iterations, most recently as a Mexican restaurant. The restaurant lasted just under 12 months before it became Dive on Division. Our apartment on North Michigan Avenue was one block away, so Division Street, and also the Viagra Triangle, was our favorite place to drink or eat. We usually had my daughter Emma with us. I wanted to take Tracy out to dinner on Valentine's Day and for purely selfish reasons surprise her with karaoke. Emma was staying the night with Al and Jean D'Amico, Tracy's parents, who owned and lived in an apartment on the top floor of our building. Nick, the owner of Dive on Division, stepped up to the microphone and announced that karaoke would start in 15 minutes, and Tracy retired to the ladies' room while I typed the lyrics to the song she'd chosen for us. I knew the song as well as I knew my name, but who wants to make a fool of themselves on stage? In the 70s and 80s, my parents were big fans of a certain genre of rock that combined music with a certain amount of theatricality. They were drawn to this genre by a songwriter named Jim Steinman. Steinman was not a typical songwriter. A famous music producer was known to have told Steinman that he didn't know a damn thing about writing music. That's why it took Steinman and Marvin Day, aka Meatloaf, almost three years to sell their concept album, Bat Out of Hell. One of the songs on that album was Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. When Tracy was looking for a song for our duet a couple years ago, I showed her a YouTube video of Meatloaf and Carla DeVito performing the song, and she loved it. That song became our staple for duets at karaoke. Soon, Tracy discovered Holding Out for a Hero, a song Steinman wrote for Bonnie Tyler for the movie Footloose. A few words about my wife. Tracy Connery, a.k.a. D'Amico, is simply stunning. Tall, slender, blonde, with a muscular butt, the result of daily visits to the gym in our house, and a 32E bust. Tracy received her master's degree in musical theater from Northwestern University, and with diploma in hand, moved to Los Angeles to become a star. Tracy soon discovered that it didn't matter how pretty she was, how well she sang or acted, there were hundreds of girls just like her. She starred in a couple commercials and had a small role in an episode of the NCIS series. When she lost the role of Dead Prostitute Hash 2, not even a basic dead prostitute. In an episode of the Law & Order series, Tracy began to rethink her career aspirations. She made an agreement with her parents that they would support her for two years in her quest to become a star. But after that, she would either become independent or have to return to Chicago. After two years, she decided to call it quits. If I'm going to work as a waitress, it's going to be in a place where I can afford to live in more than just my car, she told me. Tracy started working in the family business, and that's where we met. My name is Coy Connery, and I am the director of fixed operations at D'Amico Lincoln Ford. In other words, I report to the service manager, parts manager, and body shop manager. This is the position I've held for five years, and it's where I met Tracy three years ago. She is the only child of Al and Jean D'Amico. There are currently eight D'Amico Automotive Group dealerships scattered throughout the Chicagoland area, the largest being DLF in Lincoln Park. Tracy manages payroll for all DIG dealerships from D'Amico's headquarters at D'Amico Porsche Jaguar in the Gold Coast area of Chicago. When I first met Tracy, I was a single father with a two-year-old and working long hours as my position required. I was engaged to my daughter's mother, Caroline, when Emma was born. We were high school sweethearts and were each other's first in everything. Dating, kissing, sexual experiences, etc. 
Caroline was excited about becoming a mother throughout her pregnancy. However, after our daughter was born, Caroline began to drift away from both of us. She found it difficult to bond with her daughter and resented having to breastfeed her. One day after a long day at DLF, I came home and found our neighbor landlord, Mrs. Grunwald, watching Emma. Caroline left me a note. She can't handle being a mother and wants nothing to do with Emma or me, nor should she run after her. All of her belongings have been moved out of our apartment. I contacted Caroline's mother and she asked me to stop by and take Emma with me. Caroline's mother took Emma in her arms, hugged her gently and kissed her forehead. She handed Emma to me and told me to leave and never come back. Crying heavily and sobbing, she asked me to never come back. I realized that she had chosen her daughter over her granddaughter and I needed to protect Emma. I took Caroline and her mother at their word, found a top-notch family law attorney, and sued to terminate her parental rights because of her abandonment of our child. Caroline did not contest the matter and signed the termination of parental rights in exchange for a written assurance that I would not collect child support. Life wasn't easy, but I managed. We lived in a three-family house owned by Mrs. Grunwald, who adored Emma. After her husband died, Mrs. G rarely saw her children and grandchildren, so she took in my little family. She was heartbroken that Caroline had abandoned us and tried to make our lives as easy as possible. Our rent was ridiculously low for the Logan Square area, plus Mrs. G insisted on babysitting Emma while I worked. Without Mrs. G, I couldn't have done it. My folks had moved to Texas the previous year, and although they had offered to help me move, I was a Chicagoan. Moving to Texas held little appeal for me. I was 23 years old and had been working as a service counselor at DLF for just under a year when our service manager quit without notice. His departure left us stranded and Al frustrated. I met Al at his office and offered him a deal. Appoint me service manager for a six-month probationary period with no salary increase. If I don't perform as well as the previous service manager, demote me. No big deal. But if I perform well, the position will become permanent and the raise will be paid retroactively from the date of my promotion. The only thing I asked for was that the deal be between just the two of us. If the staff suspected I was a temp, they would have no respect for me. I would be done before I even started working. Al often said that shaking my hand on that deal was the smartest decision he'd made since he'd asked Jean to marry him. I was lucky that Al D'Amico saw something in me. Once I proved my worth, he gave me a lot of latitude in terms of time off for my daughter. In return, I grew his service business and DLF to the point where we became large enough for me to move from service manager to service director and director of fixed operations. We were the largest Ford and Lincoln dealership in the Midwest, and our service department was ranked number one in the country for service. I had a great staff of service advisors, mechanics, bodybuilders, and women, and supervisors working for me. I encouraged union participation and paid above the union scale. Al wasn't thrilled about that part, but the results spoke for themselves. We were a fine-tuned machine. At the time of our drama with Caroline, Tracy was trying to make it in Hollywood. When it was over and she returned to Chicago, Emma was two years old. Thanks to my salary at DLF, we lived comfortably. Mrs. G watched her during the day, and, since our service department was closed on weekends, that left us plenty of father-daughter bonding time. I loved Emma more than life, and her smile and happiness were what I lived for. Before she moved to California, I knew Al had a daughter named Tracy, but she never came to our dealership, so I had no contact with her. When she first walked into the DLF service department, there was an immediate mutual attraction between us. I asked Tracy out to lunch, and we immediately knew there could be something between us. On our third date, we walked past a bar in Wrigleyville that had a sign on the sidewalk that read, Karaoke Tonight. Tracy pulled me inside. She quickly filled out a couple pieces of paper and handed them to the bar employee who ran the karaoke. I grinned and filled out and handed the slip over as well. What are you singing? asked Tracy. The song, I replied with a laugh as Tracy rolled her eyes. When Tracy was called up to the impromptu stage, she sang an old Cher song, Believe, and she sang it just beautifully. I knew she could sing and was trying to make it in Hollywood, but I had no idea she was so talented. When Tracy returned to our table, it looked like her nipples were trying to break free of her sweater. She leaned over and kissed me, running her tongue over my lips and smiled at me. Speaking in front of an audience kind of turns me on, she whispered. I was called on stage next, and I sang the classic Chris Isaac song, Wicked Game. 
Tracy and I never talked about it, but both of my parents were good singers. My dad was a vocalist in a garage band in college, and my mom was in choir in high school and college. I wasn't the best singer in Chicago, but I was pretty good and could sing in a lower register and then immediately hit the high notes that Wicked Game demanded. When I sat down at our table after the song ended, Tracy was breathing heavily and her eyes were dilated. She grabbed my hand and practically dragged me from the bar without even waiting for her second song. When the cab dropped us off at my house, she watched impatiently as I fumbled with the keys to unlock the door. Once inside, she threw herself into my arms, kissing me and wrapping her legs around me as I made my way to the bedroom. The smell of her arousal was overwhelming. When I pulled her skirt up over her hips to remove her panties, I saw that they were soaked through the small triangle of thong. I'd had a few girlfriends since Caroline left me, but nothing could compare to making love to Tracy. Even though I was soaking wet, her sheath was tight around me. Our first time was frantic and rushed, but satisfying nonetheless. Her moans turned to screams as she orgasmed, and she orgasmed often and easily. It was unlike any experience I'd ever had in my life. We made love three more times before midnight. When Tracy fell asleep, she would roll over so that her head was resting on my shoulder and her leg was thrown over mine. As she snored softly, sleep eluded me as my mind raced with overexcitement. I was in love. The next morning we left early so I could drop Tracy off at her house and give her a chance to shower and change. Before we left, I stopped by Mrs. G's first floor apartment to see Emma while Tracy waited in the car. I almost called the police last night, said Mrs. G. Why? What happened? I asked in alarm. I hadn't heard anything last night. Looks like a couple of street cats have been at it all night, she replied with a smirk as I blushed with embarrassment. Ever since Caroline left, Mrs. G had been keeping me on my toes, demanding I find a good woman. We dated for three months before I introduced her to Emma. She was immediately attracted to Tracy, and Tracy, for her part, adored Emma. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and destined to become a beautiful woman, Emma could pass for Tracy's daughter. Indeed, most people automatically mistook Tracy for Emma's mother, and Tracy never bothered to correct them. Al D'Amico was thrilled that I wanted to marry Tracy. I asked his permission, of course, and he couldn't give it fast enough. Tracy was Al's only child, as his older brother had been killed in a carjacking in Cicero a few years ago. He had no children, so the future of D'Amico Automotive depended on Tracy's fate. With me as his husband, Al knew his family's legacy was in good hands. It was very timely because Mrs. G had suffered a stroke from which she never recovered. Her children jumped in to dispose of her property and let me know that they would double my rent. Emma and I moved into Tracy's apartment and were married shortly thereafter. Tracy and I were in our third year of marriage and we started talking about giving Emma a baby sister. We decided that Tracy needed to have her IUD removed and start trying for real. Today, on Valentine's Day, we went out for the first time since making that decision. We were the fourth singers to be called to the bar for karaoke. The music started playing and the lyrics started scrolling, though I knew them as well as I knew my name. I remember every little thing. It's like it just happened yesterday. Parking lot by the lake. And there wasn't a single car in sight. And I've never had a girlfriend. You look better than you did before. And all the kids at school. That night they dreamed of being in my shoes. And now our bodies are so close and tight. Never felt so good, never felt so right. And we shine like metal on a knife edge. Sparkling like metal on a knife point. Come on! Hold on tight! Come on! Hold on tight! Though it is cold and lonely in the deep dark night, I can see heaven by the light on the dashboard. Tracy had seen enough videos of Meathead and Carla DeVito to understand the moves. She knew when to turn her back to me, knew when to stand apart with her arms crossed with an annoyed look, and when to stand back to back with me. I sang my parts well. For karaoke, my performance was more than decent. Tracy rocked out and got the crowd on their feet. A few singers later, it was her turn again. She performed the song Holding Out for a Hero and brought the crowd to their feet again. After she sat down for a break, I went to the bathroom. When I returned, the stranger was sitting in my chair, leaning over Tracy. Since the table was a two-seater, I froze in an awkward position for a second before Tracy realized I had returned. The stranger stood up and held out his hand. Coy, this is Rick Riker. He has a band and he asked me to join. I looked at Riker and wasn't impressed with what I saw. 
long hair, tight jeans with a wide leather belt. He had leather straps on each wrist and a long scarf wrapped loosely around his neck. He looked to be in his early 40s, tanned, and his hair was blonde with a streak of graying. If he wanted to look like an aging rock star, he had succeeded. Hi, Koi. I'm glad to meet you. You did a great job. His smile seemed friendly, and he expressed genuine enthusiasm for my performance. Thanks, but we know who the real star in our family is. What band is that? Rick took an empty chair from the four tabletops, having asked permission beforehand, kudos to him for that, and sat down. I am the founder and lead singer of a local band called The Meltdown. We mainly perform at festivals, corporate events, and weddings. Our typical set list includes a lot of ACDC, Guns N' Roses, and so on. We've never been as successful as we should have been, given our talent, and I want to change the direction of the band. I had some thoughts, but Tracy's performance struck me like a lightning strike. Now I have an idea of what I want to do with the band, and I think Tracy is the key. I sat and pondered Rick Riker. Winters in Chicago are brutal, and summers are short but gorgeous. At the end of May, festivals begin in various neighborhoods and suburbs. Live music, beer and wine, art, and lots of other things for sale. A typical festival starts on Friday and ends on Sunday. There will be live music on at least one stage on Friday night, all day Saturday and until 6 p.m. or so on Sunday night. Sometimes bands will perform throughout the weekend, and sometimes they will only perform once. Smaller bands perform at the beginning of the day, and the last band of the day will be either a well-known local band, or, in some cases, a band that was once famous but didn't want to quit, and so is playing the festival. Local bands are made up of either full-time musicians or part-time musicians for whom the band is just a side income. Looking at Riker, you could tell he was one of the former. I looked at Tracy. Is that what you're going to do? She shrugged. Maybe. You know, I love performing on stage. Even that little applause is really good for my ego. I want to check out his band and see what they're all about. But that's it for now. Riker left, leaving Tracy a business card with his band name, email address, and the band's website address. Shortly afterward, we left as well. It had been an interesting evening. In our apartment, the smell of Tracy's arousal wafted through the bedroom. Her thong was soaked through, just as I'd suspected it would be. It had been a very good Valentine's night. Tracy found a few videos of the meltdown on YouTube some single song videos and an hour-long concert video from last year's Taste of Wicker Park Festival. The problem was that the audience seemed to consist largely of high school students. Festival bands don't exist to entertain. Their purpose is to attract a crowd of people willing to spend money on overpriced food and beer and to lure people with disposable income willing to spend that income on poorly made art and fake designer sunglasses. Fifteen-year-old boys are not the festival's target audience. Judging by the sunshine on the concert video, the band performed around noon. Not a good time. Riker probably had a hard time getting good bookings for his band. Without the name recognition of a popular band playing festivals, he couldn't get the best gigs at bars, weddings, or corporate events. I wasn't entirely comfortable with Tracy singing with Riker's band. However, I knew that the applause was fueling something deep inside her. Most people who crave worship are deeply insecure. Despite Tracy's beauty and talent, she was as insecure as any actor or musician. She invited Riker over to our house to discuss his plans. Riker wanted to go in a different direction with the meltdown. Instead of ACDC, he wanted to go for a more theatrical show. He was familiar with the songs Tracy and I did at karaoke, but never paid attention to them. When he got home, he read about Jim Steinman and watched other videos of songs he had written and produced. I was shocked! How could I not be familiar with this guy? And Meatloaf. I always thought he was just a fat white guy from back in the day. Man, thanks to you and Tracy, I saw a whole different approach. Riker wanted to mix a few Steinman songs with a few Broadway tunes. I think I'll start with the song Bad Out of Hell, then move on to Two Out of Three Ain't Bad, and then Tracy will sing somewhere from West Side Story. I had never heard of these songs until you showed them to me in a whole new light. I'm thinking of a couple ABBA songs and one or two Fleetwood Mac songs. That would be a show that would really appeal to girls. And it would attract the guys, and the guys are the ones who spend the big bucks at festivals. It's not the music I thought I was going to play, but some of these songs are pretty damn good, so I can live with that, and a gig is a gig. 
So what do you say, Tracy? Are you in? Riker was disappointed that Tracy didn't jump in the pool with both feet. She explained to him that we should discuss it, and she would let him know. After Riker left, I realized she had something to say. I know we've talked about getting my IUD removed and having kids, but performing with a band is what I want to do first. How do you envision it? It means you'll be practicing for hours every week, and then you'll be gone for the weekend. You have daddy duties to attend to. Plus, it means Emma and I will hardly ever see you. Tracy took my face in her hands. I'll come home every night. I need you like air and water. And I could never be away from Emma. I couldn't love her more if I'd given birth to her myself. I will always make time for my family. She decided that she would arrange with her father to allow her to join the band The Meltdown. Her parents knew how important performing was to her, but felt that she had already squeezed everything she could out of herself during her failed Hollywood career. Her mother, Jean, was skeptical, but her father reluctantly agreed with her desire to cut her time at D'Amico Automotive short. I had a bad feeling about the whole thing and especially Rick Riker. But Tracy stuck to her word. Rehearsals rarely ended at 7 p.m., but Tracy was always home to kiss Emma goodnight. As winter turned to spring, the band picked up momentum, putting on either a 60-minute or two-hour show. They recorded and posted several high-definition videos on YouTube. They then sent out emails to organizers of various festivals in Chicagoland. The interest in festivals didn't last long. There were a few bands that always attracted attention, but there were also many bands that disappeared. The hunt for new and different bands was a never-ending process for festival organizers. The band was not yet booked for evenings, but their new direction proved popular with festival organizers. They were soon booked through June, and most shows were at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. Not as good as the coveted 8 p.m. slot, but much better than noon. The Meltdown Festival was held every Saturday and Sunday. Some weeks they performed at the same festival on both days. But more often than not, they performed at different festivals on different days. In June, they only had one Friday night show. They could only do two shows on Friday night, at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. They were able to book one show at 6 p.m., but could not book any shows at 8 p.m. Nevertheless, things were looking up for the band. By mid-June, the band The Meltdown had become a household name. Teenage boys were leaving in droves, but women in their 20s and 40s suddenly had a new favorite festival band. It was the third weekend in June when Riker got the call that they were moving on to the next step. The organizers of Taste of Wrigleyville informed him that they needed an artist for 8 p.m. Saturday. Curtis Glow and the Sugarcane Gang, a predominantly white group that performs old-school hip-hop, had to cancel the show because of the unfortunate arrest of Robert Van Dyne, a.k.a. Curtis Glow, for insider trading at his regular job at J.P. Morgan. The meltdown was on fire that night, and the crowd in Wrigleyville was ecstatic. It wasn't just people from up north who were in attendance. That weekend was the annual Metro series between the Sox and Cubs. People from all over the Chicagoland area, as well as Wisconsin and Indiana, gathered around Wrigley Field. But the really important next step came after their performance. Two organizers of Milwaukee's Summerfest Festival were in attendance, saw the Meltdown perform, and were impressed enough with the band to offer them a pair of seats at the latest Summerfest concert series, July 4th, 8. Suddenly, Tracy had everything she could ever want and need. All it would cost her was her marriage. Emma and I went to the first few meltdown shows of festival season, but festivals are no place for a six-year-old. There was nowhere to sit, so everyone stood. There was very little family entertainment, so we spent most of our time walking from tent to tent. Emma got a free stress ball from a cell phone provider and a free bottle opener from a water filtration company. Then she moved on to some really bad work by people whose parents had obviously lied to them for years about them being talented. She was bored, and frankly, so was I. As the time for the Meltdown's performance approached, we took seats near the stage to watch Tracy perform. It was obvious that she was in her element when she was on stage, but it was strange and a little awkward to see her singing Paradise by the Dashboard Lights with someone else. It had been our song for several years, and she had a certain routine she adhered to when singing her part. It was awkward to see her standing with her arms crossed in mock annoyance at Riker or standing back to back with him singing a duet. I wasn't sure how I felt about this play. Despite my feelings, as much as she enjoyed watching her stepmother perform, Emma didn't like going to festivals. After two festivals, we stopped going there. I explained that it was too much for Emma, 
and Tracy, though disappointed, understood. The band continued to rehearse on weekdays, constantly tweaking their set list and adding new songs. As the meltdown continued to gain popularity, Tracy seemed to drift away from Emma and me. It wasn't noticeable at first. At first, Tracy would drop to her knees at the sight of Emma and hug her tightly. Now she squats down and just gives a quick hug. Several times I noticed a sad expression on Emma's face. Tracy also seemed less affectionate with me and more careful with her cell phone. I'm a lot of things, but I'm not naive or gullible. Tracy was probably cheating on me, and I knew that if she was, our marriage was over. I did what any concerned husband would do. I hired a private investigator. Lisa Larson was a family law attorney I met with. She recommended that we involve her husband Paul in the investigation before we started any legal action. Paul served for several years in U.S. Army intelligence, doing both human, human intelligence or traditional espionage, and SIGINT, signals intelligence or electronic intelligence, he said. After retiring with the rank of warrant officer, what he called CW4, he went into business for himself. He mostly handled industrial espionage cases, but since his wife specialized in family law, he occasionally ran errands for her as well. Paul had followed Tracy from rehearsal to her house several times and hadn't noticed anything unusual. He had beacons, as well as a voice recorder hidden in her car. We arranged a time to send an attachment to Tracy's cell phone, which I was able to open while she slept. It took quite a while to unlock the facial recognition system, and I was about to give up when Tracy mumbled something in her sleep and opened her eyes for a split second. I held her phone at just the right angle for it to unlock. I hoped she wouldn't remember that I was standing over her when she woke up in the morning. I managed to open an email that downloaded software that records all of Tracy's conversations, her messages, emails, and tracks all of the websites she visits. I had some doubts about what I was doing. After all, trust is the foundation of a marriage, and Tracy hadn't done anything to violate that trust. I had my suspicions, but nothing concrete. We still talked and made love. We discussed when we could have a baby again. We talked about Emma, who would be going into second grade in the fall. On a day-to-day -day basis, not much changed in our lives. But a wall grew between us. I would ask, and she would deny or dismiss it. So the only way I could see was to spy on the woman I loved. It was the video of the Meltdown's performance at Taste of Wrigleyville that made me pick my brain. After an hour-long concert and two encores, the band lined up along the stage and bowed out. Riker and Tracy hugged each other as they bowed. Riker looked at Tracy and kissed her. Tracy looked up at Riker and smiled the same smile that I thought was only meant for me. The next day, I made an appointment with Lisa Larson. She dragged her husband out to the meeting, and from that point on, it was all set. I don't think she's had sex with him yet, but she will soon, my private investigator said. Why do you think it hasn't happened yet? Lisa, my lawyer, and Paul's wife asked. I don't have anything specific, but once that line is crossed, there's usually an obvious general sense of closeness left. I don't see that with your wife and Riker yet, but I can see that they're slowly beginning to do so. It was probably good news that he hadn't had sex with my wife yet, but I still didn't see a way to save the marriage. Are we still planning on the band staying in Milwaukee for a couple nights? asked Lisa. I nodded my head. They have a concert at the AFI Amphitheater late morning on the 4th of July. Then this night and the next they're performing at Whiskeyville, a pop-up bar in downtown Milwaukee. On the 6th, they have another late morning concert at AFI. They are expected to return to Chicago on the afternoon of the 6th. Are you coming on the 4th? asked Paul. Yes. I'll stick around and wait for your call. After their show at Whiskeyville, I'll meet them if they happen to be together in one of the rooms. If not, I'll go to Chicago and be back on the evening of the 5th. Sounds like you've got it all worked out. I don't even want to know how you managed to sneak cameras into their hotel rooms. Paul grinned. You'll see it on my bill. It wasn't cheap. Any videotapes in their room won't count as evidence, but they might be useful in negotiations. I still don't think confronting them is the right move. I don't want things to go south, so I'm going to search you for weapons before I let you meet with them. I understand. I don't want to put you in a bad situation. I have a six-year-old daughter to think about. There's no way I'm going to jeopardize her future. If Tracy cheats, I'll get out of the marriage. If not, we have a lot of work to do in marriage counseling. I can't look at her and not see that wide smile she gives Riker at the end of their show. Tracy was on top of the world. 
the band The Meltdown had just performed in front of tens of thousands of people. It was the biggest crowd they had ever performed in front of, by a thousand percent. Called out for two encores, The Meltdown received sullen looks from the band that was scheduled to perform after them. There was no way they could match this performance, and they knew it. The group had time to go to the hotel, have dinner and a nap, and then head to Whiskeyville for a two-hour show at 9 p.m. If they were lucky, they would be back at the hotel by midnight. Tracy felt insecure and didn't know how to spend the evening. She missed Coy and Emma and knew that what she expected from tonight could end her marriage, but her relationship with Rick was accelerating. Their chemistry on stage had spilled over beyond her, and the other band members could see that something was going on between them. No one said anything as they were too busy enjoying their meteoric rise from mediocre local festival band to performing at Summerfest. It had been a fast and wild ride. After the morning show at Summerfest, Rick invited Tracy to his room, but she declined. She wanted to take a nap and relax before tonight's show. Irritation flashed across Rick's face for a moment, but then his usual smirk reappeared. She confirmed that their meeting was still on. The concert at the Whiskeyville Pop Bar that night was standing room only. The bar was set up outdoors on the street in front of Capitol Grill. The temporary bar stretched the full width of the street and folding chairs were provided on a first-come, first-served basis. An area was left in front of the plywood stage for dancing. The band started their set with Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, then moved into Bad Out of Hell, and then straight into the Fleetwood Mac classic, Go Your Own Way. The crowd was pumped up and ready to party. That was almost as good as sex, Rick Riker laughed as the room door closed behind him. I don't think anything can be as good as sex, Tracy says. But getting that reaction is pretty close. Rick grabbed her and enclosed her in a hug. We were ready, but she was overcome with uncertainty. What is she doing here? She asked herself. I shouldn't be here. Rick didn't pay attention to the noise outside the door of his room until it reached him that someone was knocking. I'll ignore them and they'll go away, Rick thought to himself. But the knocking became even more insistent. Better answer that, Tracy said. She reached for her bra and top. Rick sighed and stood up. Rick looked through the peephole and saw a middle-aged white man. He swung the door open. What the hell are you? was all Rick could mutter. Coy Connery stood in the hallway on the side of the door, leaning his back against the wall while his private investigator knocked. As soon as the door opened, he squeezed inside past Rick, interrupting his angry question. Coy walked around the corner to the bed. He saw Tracy stretched out on the bed. When Tracy saw Coy, her eyes widened with horror. No, she said almost to herself. Coy, it's not what it seems, Tracy said with a desperate note in her voice. Really? Coy asked. Then what's the big deal? Because it looks like you were going to have sex with Rick. Tracy began to cry and gasp. Let me explain, she managed to mumble. Go ahead, Coy said. I'm all ears. It was an accident. I wasn't going to go for it. You have to forgive me. Baby, please. Coy shook his head and turned around. Rick leaned against the wall, a look of defeat on his face. Coy wasn't the first husband he'd crossed. She's yours now, Coy said to Rick. I don't want anything to do with her. Good luck to you, rock star. The latter was particularly painful for Rick. He'd been trying to succeed in music for decades. With one sarcastic remark, Coy made Rick look like a wannabe. Paul nodded to Coy, leaving the room and closing the door behind him. Are you okay? Hell no. But I will. What were we talking about? Paul nodded his head. He had a leather strap with metal hooks on both ends. One hook went around the doorknob and the other hooked into the doorframe. That way, the door could not be opened from the inside. That would give Coy a few extra minutes and prevent Tracy from trying to chase him. If, of course, she wanted to at all. In the parking lot, Coy turned off his cell phone, not wanting to be tracked or contacted. He walked over to the two vans that belonged to the group. He pulled a pair of side cutters out of his back pocket and cut the stems off all eight tires, then got in his car to drive back to Chicago. He exhaled deeply. Damn! He shouted into the windshield. I picked up Emma from the neighbors and started packing when we got home. 
Luckily, Al and Jean were spending the night in Milwaukee tonight, so I didn't have to see them. I knew they were in Whiskeyville. I purposely stayed away from the bar and relatives, not wanting Tracy to know I was in town. If she was going to end up in Riker's room or he in her room, I wasn't going to get in their way. I pulled out all the suitcases and packed almost everything Emma and I owned. The plan was for me to spend the night in a hotel and meet with Lisa Larson in the morning to give her the green light to file the divorce papers. The last act in Chicago would be something I dreaded almost as much as divorcing Tracy, meeting my father-in-law. I still had an American Express card in my name only, from back when I was single, so Tracy had no way to track me that way. We had a joint checking account for paying bills, into which we both deposited a certain amount of money each month. I was picking up half of that amount. Our house was a gift to Tracy from her parents when she moved to Chicago from California. Tracy was free to take it. I left only a few of my belongings in the house, but nothing that couldn't be easily replaced. I ended the evening by sending an email to Emma's school, letting them know that an emergency had arisen and I would have to take Emma out of town. Tracy was listed as having full access to Emma and her records, but she had never officially adopted Emma. Tracy and I had discussed the matter, and Tracy really wanted to adopt Emma. We decided to wait until we had a child together, and then Tracy would adopt Emma. Thank goodness I didn't blow it off, I thought. That was one less confusion. At dinner, I tried to explain to Emma that Tracy and I were not going to get married again. Emma started crying and begged me to tell Tracy that I was sorry for leaving. How do you explain infidelity to a child? Eventually, she calmed down. But as a father, I hated to hear my daughter crying for the only mother she had ever known. I spent a restless night and finally fell asleep for a few hours. When I woke up, I showered and got dressed, then made Emma get up and get dressed. We had breakfast in the hotel restaurant before we left. While Emma waited at the secretary's office, I had a brief meeting with Lisa Larson. She was sad but ready to file for divorce. Paul had already told her about Tracy naked in Rick Riker's hotel room. Lisa said she would keep me informed and let me use her computer to type and print a letter for Al. My next stop was to visit D'Amico Porsche Jaguar, the headquarters of D'Amico Automotive Group. Coy, what the hell is going on? I've been calling you all morning. Tracy is at my house in hysterics. Al was red and angry. I could see he was in daddy bear mode this morning. He was protective of his little girl and ready to destroy anyone who hurt her. That's something you need to discuss with her, I said. I'm only here to give you this. I put the envelope on Al's desk. Al looked at the envelope as if it were a coiled snake ready to lunge at him if he reached for it. What's that? said Al. He was suddenly very curious as to why I was in his office. Just read it, Al, I said. Al reached into the envelope and pulled out a letter. It was short. Barely a paragraph. Effective today, I am stepping down as director of fixed operations for D'Amico Lincoln Ford. It has been an honor and privilege to work for the D'Amico family. Al shook his head. No, it couldn't be. This was a disaster. Losing his son-in-law, who was also his best employee. The man who was the future of D'Amico Automotive. Tears came to Al's eyes. Coy, son, whatever it is, we can fix it. We can get through this. We're family! Not anymore, Al. I love you and Jean. Hell, I still love Tracy. But in time, we'll all treat it differently. We're going to leave Chicago. I don't know exactly where we're going, but Illinois is done. I turned to leave. I'll miss your family, I said as I walked out of Al's office. Tracy! shouted Al D'Amico, walking through the front door of their apartment. Tracy's car was parked in the driveway, so he knew she was there. Tracy Elena Connery, get your ass over here right now, roared Al. Jean ran into the living room. She had never seen Al so agitated. What's going on, Al? Why are you yelling? Where's your daughter? shouted Al. I'm here, Daddy, she said as she slowly entered the room. His daughter looked just awful. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying and her hair was a mess. At any other time, Al would have felt sorry for her. Tell me what happened between you and Coy, Al demanded. Tracy sobbed. Coy saw something he took the wrong way and took offense at me. He said he was going to divorce me. What did he see? growled Al ominously. It's okay, Dad. He's got it all wrong! 
where did this happen? And you better not lie to me. It was at the Marriott Hotel in Milwaukee, Tracy muttered. In your room? asked Al. Tracy shook her head, refusing. She'd never been good at lying to her father, and she couldn't start now. Whose room? asked Al. Rick's, Tracy said in a voice barely above a whisper. You slept with him? No, Daddy. I promise I never slept with him. What were you wearing when Coy saw you? asked Al. Panties, Tracy said quietly. Your husband found you in another man's hotel room, and you were naked except for a pair of panties. Is that the crux of the matter? Tracy nodded her head and tears ran down her cheeks. Oh, baby, John said. How could you do that to your husband? John looked her husband in the eye. Looks like Coy stopped him just in time. How can we fix this? We can't, Al stated emphatically. Of course we can. I know they love each other. They can get through this. We'll help them. Coy came to me this morning and tendered his resignation. Al held out Coy's resignation letter to Jean. She turned pale as she read it. Poor Coy, she said. She loved Coy like a son, and Emma was absolutely delighted. She adored the little girl. The thought of never seeing Coy or Emma again made Jean sit up and sob like her daughter. It's a lot worse than you think. Al said. Jean and Tracy looked at Al. How could it be worse? Of Dieg's eight dealerships, six of them are virtually breaking even, and one of them is losing money every month. Coy's service department is a huge part of Dieg's revenue and keeps Dieg afloat as the used car market has been very tough the last couple years. Coy has turned the service department into the highest rated and most profitable of any brand dealership in the Midwest. Al closed his eyes and shook his head. I was going to promote Coy to Vice President of Fixed Operations for all of DAG. I thought he could get all of our dealerships up and running. And now? I just hope we can hold out. Al had misery written all over his face, and his wife and daughter were crying in each other's arms. Twenty-seven months later. Are you and Emma spending Thanksgiving with your folks? asked Ken Saunders. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and we stood in the parking lot and chatted before heading home for the day. I had been working at Bullard Motors for a little over two years. After leaving Chicago, Emma and I traveled to Texas to stay with my parents. Four years ago, they had moved to Franklin Farms, a gated community for people over 55 with a golf course east of Dallas, Texas. The pandemic changed a lot of things for a lot of people. My father had worked for the same company for 30 years, and when COVID broke out, his whole company switched to telecommuting. It was a new experience for him, but he adapted quickly. Dad had always been tech savvy, so he easily navigated the tools and systems needed to work remotely. When faced with the choice of staying remote or coming into the office every day, he chose to stay remote. This allowed them to pick up stakes and move where they wanted to go. They chose Franklin Farms. Dad was an avid golfer and mom was into pickleball, joined a women's club and did volunteer work. The golf club had a restaurant and bar, and the clubhouse had monthly concerts and dances, so they were busy and active. Emma and I had visited them before, but back then they were new and still feeling out of place. After living in Franklin for a few years, they had settled in, and I had never seen them so busy and happy. However, they were shocked to learn about Tracy. I explained everything to them on our first evening with them. That girl loved you to death. What could have pushed her to cheat? My mom asked. There was a slight accusation in that question that I chose to ignore. I guess she didn't love me as much as you think she did, I replied. I couldn't cheat on her any more than I could give up Emma. I don't think she felt the same affection for me. And it all started when she joined that group? She wasn't cheating on you before that? I don't think she's ever cheated before, but who knows? It didn't take Tracy long to track us down. I blocked her on my cell phone and only communicated with her through my lawyer. She flew into DFW Airport, rented a car, and then showed up at my parents' door. I was walking with Emma when Tracy showed up. My mom invited her in for coffee. Tracy, I'm so disappointed in you, my mom said. Never in a million years would I have thought you would have an affair and cheat on Coy. Mrs. Connery, I too am disappointed in myself. Disappointed and ashamed. 
I don't even know how this happened, how I let myself do this. She shook her head puzzled. I can't explain any of it. I'm just grateful to Koi for coming up in time to stop it all. Tracy, until you understand how it happened, you can't be sure it won't happen again. Have you thought about seeing someone? A therapist? Tracy nodded. I start therapy next week. Tracy took a deep breath before asking the next question. Do you know how long he plans to stay here? I'm hoping he'll go to marriage counseling with me to work on our marriage. I'll do anything to stay married to him. My mom saw the sincerity on Tracy's face and didn't want to burst her bubble. Honey, they're not going back to Chicago. Koi found a job and signed a 12-month lease on an apartment. You need to start planning your life without them. Tracy burst into tears and flew back to O'Hare that same day. Ken's question brought me out of my reverie. Yeah, we're going to have Thanksgiving with them. Since they moved to Texas, they've had their previous Thanksgiving at the clubhouse every year. This will be Mom's first attempt at a Southern-style Thanksgiving. She'll even make cornbread for the stuffing. I mean, that's the dressing, right? Isn't that what you call it around here? If a turkey isn't shoved up your butt for cooking, it's a condiment, Ken laughs. Ken and I were lucky enough to find each other. Bullard Motors was located in Bullard, Texas, in East Texas, a few miles from Tyler. Tyler had grown tremendously over the years, from 75,000 residents in 1990 to 110,000 today. The surrounding communities have grown even faster. One of those communities, Bullard, was one of the fastest growing cities in Texas, and Texas was one of the fastest growing states in the United States. Ken owned Bullard Motors for 30 years and did not keep up with the growth of the neighborhood. He put very little money into the dealership, as evidenced by the Ford Lincoln Mercury sign still hanging over the building. Mercury has been defunct since 2010. I found an ad for a service manager position on Indeed.com and, instead of applying online, drove to Bullard to tour the dealership and possibly meet the general manager if he was available. The dealership was clean and tidy, as was the service department, as far as I could see. Everything else did not impress me. I went into the service department to find out how long to wait for an oil change. I was shocked when the consultant told me two days. The owner and general manager, Ken Saunders, was on site and took the time to meet with me, but he was wondering why I hadn't applied through Indeed. Honestly, I was afraid you wouldn't believe my resume, I said before handing him a hard copy of it. As he read the resume, I followed his surprise and skepticism, and his eyebrows rose steadily. Yeah, it's hard to believe, he said. Go to Ford Star and look up my name, I replied. Ken logged onto the Ford dealer portal and did just that. He whistled quietly a few times as he read about some of my awards and incentives. What the hell do you want to work here for? What are you in the witness protection program? I laughed. No, nothing that exciting. I caught my wife cheating on me. Since my folks now live outside of Dallas, I decided to move here. I packed up my daughter Emma and here I am. Did your wife let you take your daughter? Or did you kidnap her? Ken had a very concerned look on his face. Good for you, I thought. Neither. She's not Emma's mother. She loved Emma, but she doesn't have a say. We argued about cheating wives, and Ken told me about his own experience with his first wife cheating on him. He was very happy now, even though he had come a long way. What would you change about the service department? He asked, giving me a tour. Pretty much everything, I replied. I can turn your business around. I can turn your service department into the kind of profit center you've only dreamed of. But, he muttered slowly. Yes, there's always a but, isn't there? In this case, the but is that it won't be cheap. You'll have to get your checkbook out. You'll get me for a lot less than I'm usually willing to accept. But we'll have a contract to meet benchmarks that we'll set together. And when I reach those benchmarks, and I will, you'll pay me. A lot. The following week, I started my new job as service manager at what will become Bullard Ford Lincoln once the new signage goes up. That was over two years ago. I asked Ken if he and Lily were inviting their grandchildren over for Thanksgiving. Kayla and Rob are coming over tonight with their company, and Ken Jr. and Lisa are already here with the baby. One of the changes over the past couple of years was that as his dealership became more profitable, Ken was able to afford a larger home. He could now accommodate his entire family for the holidays with room to spare. 
Another reason for Ken's opinion was that I couldn't go wrong. Ken shook my hand and told me again that among the many things he was grateful for was my life. Tears welled up in his eyes as he squeezed my hand and then took me into a man's arms. We both turned to look at the neighboring lot. A month ago, graders and bulldozers had shown up here to begin work on leveling the hilly terrain on the empty lot. We had no idea what exactly was planned to be done. The county had issued DCA Enterprises a limited permit, but it didn't specify a specific use. For now, they were allowed to level and grade the land, but no other construction work could take place without a full building permit. At that time, a specific use permit would be issued, and all licensing issues would have to be resolved with the property owner. This would probably not happen until the new year at the earliest. Have you heard anything? I asked. Ken shook his head. Nothing. That's what's weird about it. Usually you hear something from someone. It makes me realize it's probably not Hooters or a strip club. I laughed at this one. Hooters next door to the dealership will be a bargain when it comes time to recruit auto techs. Thanksgiving went well for Connery. My mom's first attempt at making corn chowder turned out great, even if it was a little dry. The turkey was moist and flavorful, and everything was going great until the doorbell rang in the evening. Emma had already been put to bed, and we three adults were chatting while watching It's a Wonderful Life on TV. My father opened the door and then returned with visitors. Alan Jean D'Amico. Hi, everyone. Sorry to interrupt your Thanksgiving, but I was hoping to talk to Coy. I was in mild shock at the sudden appearance of my former in-laws. My divorce from Tracy had been final for over a year and a half. Tracy didn't fight back or contest anything. She quickly signed everything my attorney sent to her lawyer. She did not ask for alimony or spousal maintenance. I signed a quitclaim deed to the apartment. It was a gift from Alan Jean, so it was only right that Tracy keep it. I was not required to attend the divorce hearing and chose not to appear in person. Lisa Larson informed me that Tracy and her parents attended the hearing. Tracy cried throughout the proceedings, and after the hearing was over, her father helped her out the door. For almost two years, I hadn't heard a word from anyone in the D'Amico family. Hell, for all I knew, Tracy was now Tracy Riker, and there were one or more little Rikers crawling around the apartment. I escorted Al into my father's den and poured them each a glass of bourbon. You're looking good, Coy, Al began. I only nodded my head at Al's attempt at conversation. After so long without contact, there was bound to be awkwardness between us. We're in Texas on business, and I took a chance on you and Emma coming to visit your parents for the vacations. Al looked away for a moment, and he thought tears came to his eyes. We miss you, son. We miss you both. I nodded my head. We miss you too. I couldn't ask for better mothers-in-law than you and Jean. Not a day goes by that I don't wish. My voice broke with sadness at the thought of what could have been, but never would be. I know, Al said. Jean and I talk about you every day. Even if I could, I said, I wouldn't want to move back to Chicago. And as much as I loved being your COO, I couldn't do it again. There are too many memories. I know. Besides, there's nothing to go back to. I've sold all the dealerships. I looked at Al with an expression that I'm sure was shocked. The dealership was his baby, and so was Tracy. His father had founded D'Amico Automotive over 60 years ago. Why? How? I managed to stammer. Six of them were break-even, and one was unprofitable. The only reason I held on to them was market share. Your service department was critical to keeping everything afloat. When you left, I realized that D'Amico Automotive's days were numbered. We hung on for a couple more years, and that allowed me to sell every dealership. DLF was the last to go. God, now I feel awful, I said. I expected Al to hire a replacement for me, and everything would go smoothly. No, roared Al. It's not your fault. You had to do what was best for you and Emma. No one blames you for this. Not me. Not Jean and certainly not Tracy. At the mention of my ex-wife's name, I looked up at Al. How's Tracy doing? I believe she and Rick Riker got married. It was a statement that sounded like a question. Al laughed briefly. The last time she saw that goon was in Milwaukee, when you caught her about to make the worst mistake of her life. No, she didn't marry him. Or anyone else. Hell, as far as I know, she wasn't even dating anyone. And I guess I do, since she lives at home. She didn't stay in the apartment? 
sold it. She took half the money and put the other half in a 529 college savings plan. That's smart. By the time she has kids, he'll be grown big enough to pay for their college completely. You're right. And the first person to benefit from it is only 10 years away from starting college. It took me a moment to realize it. Emma? That's her plan. Al drained his glass and started to leave the room. I followed him. This is a bad idea, I said. She needs to let go of the past. Oh, believe me, it is. Al paused to say goodnight to my parents while Jean pulled on a light jacket. Sixty-degree weather on Thanksgiving will take some getting used to, Jean laughed. I knew I looked puzzled by her comment. What do you mean by get used to it? I asked. Al grinned. The business I'm in Texas for? That's the business I'm starting. We're here to watch at home. I looked at Al in shock. And Tracy? Is she staying in Chicago? Jean giggled as Al looked at her with amusement. Do you want to tell him or do you want me to do the dirty work? Tell him. He still likes me. I want to keep it that way. I suddenly felt a heaviness in my stomach. John looked at me sympathetically. Poor boy. I guess you didn't hear that Tyler's school has a new drama teacher this year. Jean looked at my parents. Say, was that meatloaf singer not from around here? I spent the rest of the Thanksgiving holiday in a state of shock. Monday morning I was still restless and felt impending doom. I didn't know it, but my day was about to get much worse. Monday morning is the busiest time at the service center. Over the weekend, cars break down or have noises and vibrations, so Monday is the first day cars are sent out for repairs or diagnostics. Cars need to be ready to be loaned out, consultants and technicians need to be beefed up with coffee and on top of their game, and the service department needs to be working at full capacity. On Monday mornings, I've always tried, whenever possible, to be on standby and help out as much as possible. I was always very hands-on, and that was one of the many qualities that made me good at my job. Ken had sent me a text asking me to stop by his office as soon as the morning rush subsided, so at 10 a.m. I was sitting in the chair across from my boss's desk. I had an interesting call on Saturday, Ken says. From whom? Al D'Amico, Ken said. I was afraid of that, I said. He visited me on Thursday. What did he want? Ken picked up his coffee cup and studied the contents for a while before looking me in the eye. To ransom me. Lock, stock, and barrel. Jesus, I said. Yes, I know. He offered me 20% of the current value. You'd be crazy not to take it. There's one condition, Ken said. In what condition, I asked. All the employees have to stay. It's a good condition, I replied. Including the service manager, Ken said. I see, I said. So if I stay, you get a big paycheck and all your hard work will be worth it. If not, you get nothing. I wouldn't say nothing. He's still willing to buy me out, but the 20% premium is gone if you don't stay at least a year. The premium goes into escrow and will be paid to me at the end of the year. Everything else is cash. I have another little bit of news for you. I'm not sure I want to hear it, I said. I learned what DCA Enterprises does from next door, D'Amico and Connery Automotive. I asked who Connery was at DCA, you or your ex-wife. He just shrugged and said, both. Both and both. Does it matter? I ran my hands through my hair in frustration. You don't have to say anything right now. Why don't you take a few days to think about it and let me know? Coy, whatever you decide is fine with me. You've done more for this dealership in two years than anyone else has done in the last 30 years. Thanks to you, I've been able to pay myself some nice bonuses. I know you're well paid, but I want you to know that I appreciate you. If you want me to back out of the whole deal and leave things the way they are, with just you and me running the store, then that's what I'll do. If you want to walk away, I understand. My feelings won't be hurt either way. Christmas was the slowest time of the year at Bullard Ford Lincoln. Usually, Ken and I would sit in his office and work on the budget and goals for the next year. Since Ken would soon no longer be interested in the BFL, consulting with him was unnecessary. Al had complete confidence in my judgment and therefore gave me the freedom to set my own budget and goals for the coming year. I agreed to stay with the BFL for one year. 
That was the minimum necessary for Ken to get his purchase bonus. Alan Jean found a house in the Azalea neighborhood of Tyler, a historic Tyler neighborhood with grand old houses that spoke of real money. Al and Jean were not in as much distress as I had assumed, judging by their choice of house and cash payment for BFL. They had just completed the move, settling in and acclimatizing to Tyler. I hadn't seen or heard anything about Tracy. I got online and was surprised to find that Tracy had been at Tyler since the beginning of the school year and was working as a drama teacher. This confused me. Apparently, she had moved to Tyler because I lived there and worked just a few miles down the road in Bullard. However, she never contacted me or showed herself in any way. In a way, having Tracy living in Tyler was like a sword of Damocles hanging over my head, just waiting for the thread to break and the sharpened point to sink into my skull. Two years of separation from Tracy had brought a certain indifference through time and distance. But now? Not so much. The week before Christmas, I decided to let Emma know that her former stepmom was living in Tyler. I know, Dad. I talked to her. At those words, my eyes bulged. When? Where? What did she tell you? A few weeks ago, the middle school put on a show for us in the auditorium. I talked to her then. She hugged me and said she missed me. She said she did something bad to you, and that's why she couldn't be with us. Why didn't you tell me about this? I just found out a few days ago that she was living in Tyler. When did we start keeping secrets from each other? Did Tracy ask you not to tell me anything? I could hear the accusatory tone in my voice, and that upset me more than anything. Emma had never kept secrets from me. Emma shook her head. No, Daddy. She told me she hurt you, and I didn't want to make you feel bad by talking about her. She didn't ask me not to say anything. Emma started to cry because she could see I was upset. I picked her up in my arms and hugged her, kissing her cheek. It's okay, baby. Tracy was very important to both of us. Do you think you'll ever marry again? Why are you asking me this, Emma? I don't. You just never go on dates or anything like that. You just go to work and then come home. It's like you don't have any fun in your life. And now that Mr. Ken is selling the dealership, I'm worried about you. I smiled proudly at my daughter. Are you sure you're only eight? I need my Jim, Ted, and Lila in their places, proclaimed Tracy, her voice cutting through the chatter of the cast and crew. This year's Christmas show was supposed to be the Holiday Inn. Most people know the show from the 1942 movie starring Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire with music by Irving Berlin. The musical premiered in 2016 and has become a holiday classic in just a few years. The show will run for four performances and all seats have already been sold out. This was the last dress rehearsal and the audience was packed with teachers and office staff, as well as a few students who had a free period during the last class of the day. Tracy gave the signal and the orchestra began the overture. They played for a few minutes and then moved on to the first song of the show, Steppin' Out With My Baby. Two and a half hours later, when Jim and Linda sang the last notes of the reprise of White Christmas, the cast began the finale, and then the curtain came down to a standing ovation from the audience. Tom Dalton, principal of Tyler High School, enthusiastically shook hands with his new drama teacher. This is by far the best thing the theater department has ever done. It's first class! First class, he exclaimed. Principal Dalton would have said that about the show even if he hadn't had a bit of a crush on Tracy Connery. All he knew about her was that she was from Chicago, divorced, and had done a commercial a few years ago, and that her father had recently bought a Ford dealership in Bullard. So, among other things, she was also flush with cash. Tom was a deacon in the Church of Christ and happily married, so he would never have acted on his attraction, but... I should have given this to you, Tom said holding out four tickets to the last performance to Tracy. Thank you, Tracy smiled happily. Two front row tickets had gone to her parents, but the other two would likely go unused. But she had to give it a try. I was talking to Mark Thrasher, my parts manager, when I got a message on the service disc. Being called out by one of the service advisors was not unusual, although it didn't happen as often as it used to. I empowered the consultants to deal with customer complaints, assuring them that I would never criticize any action they took to make the customer happy. As a result, when I received a page, I knew the situation was heated to the max. Or, in this case, my ex-wife, standing in the service area as my service advisors stared at her in amazement. 
Even Wilma, who despite her outward masculinity and butch haircut was 100% straight, looked at Tracy with undisguised lust. Everyone, this is Al D'Amico's daughter, Tracy. Tracy, this is Wilma, Wayne, Thomas, and Abe are our service counselors. After shaking everyone's hand and saying how pleased she was to meet them, Tracy asked if we could talk in my office. After getting comfortable, Tracy moved on to the purpose of her visit. I know I'm not your favorite person, but I have a favor to ask, Tracy said. What's the favor? I asked. Tyler High is putting on a Holiday Inn Christmas show. I have front row tickets for the last night for my parents, you and Emma. I leaned back in my chair. Tracy, I don't know if this is a good idea. Emma told me she talked to you a few weeks ago. I didn't even know you were in town. And meanwhile, my daughter has been keeping secrets from me about you. Tracy looked upset. Coy, I didn't ask her to do that. I would never ask her to keep secrets from you. And that's what she said. It's all part of the puzzle I'm trying to put together, but I have no idea what it's supposed to look like. The only reason you came to Tyler is because you wanted to come back to me. The only reason your father bought the Bullard Ford was to help you get back to me. You've been living here for a few months now, and this is the first time you've come to me. You have a goal, and I know it's to get back to me. But I can't figure out how you're going to accomplish that goal. Ignoring me for months. Tracy, what the hell is going on? Tracy smiled radiantly. Coy, you know I love you. I've loved nothing but you since the first time I saw you. Marriage to you was the best part of my life. And I ruined it. I, uh, no one else. If you hadn't interrupted us, I would have slept with that absolute waste of space. But I didn't. I had over two years of therapy to figure out what happened and what led up to that night. I would have loved to sit down and talk with my therapist about everything I've been able to figure out. But we'll have to do that another time, because I don't think the service manager's office at the Ford dealership is the right place to have that conversation. Tracy pulled the tickets out of her purse and placed them on my desk. All four performances are sold out, so if you don't want to use them, please give them to someone else. But I really hope to see you and Emma there. With those words, Tracy smiled at me, stood up, and walked out of my office and the service department. As soon as Emma saw Al and Jean, she rushed to them and scurried away. Al picked her up and hugged her tightly, and Jean wrapped her arms around both of them. They were all three crying with joy, and I felt a lump in my throat. Damn her, I thought for the millionth time. She took that away from them. This time, however, I couldn't summon the same anger in me as I had in the past. We're so glad you decided to come, John said. I didn't think you were coming, but Al and Tracy said you'd be here. I provided this to Emma. She found some Holiday Inn videos that were recorded at the Drury Lane Theater in Oak Brook, Illinois. After watching them, there was no doubt in our minds that we were coming. She even picked out a new dress for tonight. She looks beautiful. You should be proud of her, Coy, Jean said, thinking. That stupid, stupid daughter of mine. How could she pull something like that? Emma sat mesmerized throughout the entire performance. It was the first time she had ever seen a musical performed live. When the actors took their bows, she jumped up and down and clapped with delight. When the actors called Tracy to come forward to take a bow, the audience went wild. The new drama teacher glowed as she bowed. Her gaze fell on Emma in the front row, and suddenly her glow rose to eleven. She smiled beautifully, and tears rolled down her cheeks as the curtain fell. We're going to Dakota's, Al said as the audience began to leave the auditorium. Please come with us. I appreciate your offer, Al, but it's getting late and Emma is tired. You should ask me if I'm tired, Emma said grumpily, crossing her arms in front of her. I've never been to the Dakota. Truth be told, neither have I. It was Tyler's most expensive steakhouse, and the prices there were no lower than at Jean and Giorgetti's in Chicago. Come on, Coy, Jean said. Don't make the old lady beg. I laughed. Okay, I give up. I'll meet you there. Jean grabbed Coy by the sleeve and looked at me intently. You promise? You promise you'll come? I smiled at my former mother-in-law. We'll be there. I promise. The Dakota was crowded, as it was a Saturday night during the Christmas holidays, and our company had no reservations. I didn't know how he did it, but back in Chicago I'd seen Al pull the same rabbit out of his hat more than once. 
Me, Emma, Jean, and Tracy went to the bar to order cocktails while Al checked in at the front desk. I knew Al would have us seated at a table within 15, 20 minutes, and I was not disappointed. Tracy, thank you for having us. It was amazing. It was as good as anything we've seen in town. I felt awkward after that statement. I didn't want to talk about the time Tracy and I got married, but it came out on its own. That was so great, Mo. Tracy! Emma caught herself before she could call Tracy mom. Excuse me, Tracy said suddenly, standing up and heading quickly toward the restroom. She seemed to have tears in her eyes. When Tracy and I were married, Emma referred to Tracy as mom in conversation with her. It made sense. Her own mother had abandoned her when she was very young and never addressed her. Tracy had married me when Emma was only three years old, so she was the only mother Emma had ever known. But after we moved to Tyler, we agreed that we would address Tracy as Tracy instead of mom. Emma, let's go see how my daughter is doing, Jean said. She pushed back Emma's chair and they walked toward the restroom. Maybe this wasn't the best idea, I said. Al looked at me in surprise. Really? Yes, seriously. Why? What am I missing? Tracy still considers herself Emma's mother. It is heartbreakingly painful for her not to be in her life. Every now and then events happen that trigger an emotional response in her like what happened now. I'll tell you what was the worst. We were driving from Chicago to Springfield because I had business in the state capitol. We were listening to an old radio station and an old meatloaf song came on that you two were singing. Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, I think it's called. Anyway, that song came on and Tracy had trouble breathing. The next thing I knew, she had her hands over her ears, rocking back and forth and yelling, Turn it off! Turn it off! I couldn't change the channel fast enough. I turned the car around, and all the way to Chicago we listened to classical music. Al grinned bitterly. I was going to offer a contract to DLF for government car maintenance. But it was more important to me to get my daughter home. And then she went to treatment? Al snorted. That was after a year of therapy. She gets upset when she hears any song she did with that band, The Meltdown. But this particular song? She told me it was your song, yours and hers, and then she sang it on stage with that asshole. She manages to hide it pretty well, but the guilt can be unbearable. Al took a sip of his martini and set the glass on the floor. Look, I know you think she moved here to get you back, and that everything we're doing is helping her. But it isn't. Her being in the same town as you has been good for her. You didn't even know she lived in Tyler. I hope you can be at least a friend to her, but if it doesn't work for you, then so be it. It won't affect our working relationship in any way. At that moment, the ladies returned, smiling and laughing. Tracy was carrying Emma, who looked at her with adoration. Oh, hell, I thought to myself. We're spending Christmas with Al and Jean, my mom said. What are you doing? I asked in bewilderment. You have excellent hearing, so if you're asking me to repeat what I said, it's to buy time and make a smart remark to your elderly mother. So now that I've given you time to think about something, hit me with it. Fifty-four is not old age, I muttered. Never mind, she said. So what time are you coming over to Alan Jean's? We weren't invited, I said. But you and Dad will have fun, okay? It was two days before Christmas, and Emma and I were watching a Christmas movie on Netflix when the doorbell rang. I opened the door and saw Tracy standing there. I stepped aside so my ex-wife could enter. The house had an open floor plan, so the living room and kitchen were one large room. As she quickly looked around the room, I figured Tracy would be looking for traces of our marriage, but I'd left everything in Chicago. There was a flicker of sadness on her face, and then she turned to face me and smiled again. Can I offer you something to drink? A glass of wine? She smiled at me and then at Emma. No, I can't stay. I came to invite you over for Christmas. That's very nice of you, but we were just going to sit here and bake cinnamon rolls and open presents. Tracy looked confused. Since my parents were spending Christmas with her family, I guess it hadn't occurred to her that I might decline her invitation. Emma didn't like my answer either. Please, Daddy, I want to go. If you don't want to go, I can go myself. I closed my eyes and exhaled. Then I looked at my daughter and smiled. Sure, we can go, baby. 
Emma clapped her hands excitedly and Tracy looked at me with obvious gratitude. Come over around 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve for dinner. We'll have cocktails afterward and then go to the service. We'll sleep in on Christmas Eve and then we'll get up and bake cinnamon rolls and open presents. Tracy's smile lit up the room. It's going to be a wonderful Christmas. Sleep tight so the bedbugs don't bite. Oh, Daddy, Emma said in feigned desperation. I'm not too. I closed the door, once again wishing Emma a good night. It was actually a very pleasant Christmas Eve. Jean and my mom made a traditional Texas Christmas dinner of tamales, free joles, and rice. My mom had learned how to make authentic Mexican food in one of the cooking classes at Franklin Farms, so the tamales were made from scratch. I found them to be very tasty. We had a couple glasses of single malt whiskey from Al's wine cabinet before walking a couple blocks to the First Presbyterian Church for the 7.30 service. The Christmas Eve service was called Moravian Love Feast. It consisted of a scone, punch, and hymn singing. I never liked going to church, but Tracy was a member of the huge Fourth Presbyterian Church in Chicago on Michigan Avenue, and Emma and I enjoyed going to the candlelight service with her on Christmas Eve. The First Presbyterian Church of Tyler was not as impressive as the Fourth Presbyterian Church of Chicago, but it was nice. After the church service, we went back to the D'Amico house and I put Emma to bed. Can we talk? Tracy asked. I knew it was coming. Sure, let me get my jacket. We walked in silence for a few minutes, looking at the brightly decorated houses in the historic district. You know I still love you, don't you? asked Tracy. I know you believe that, I replied. Don't you think I still love you? asked Tracy. I don't think anyone who truly loves another person would cheat on them. I think every bit of intimacy you achieved with Riker came at the cost of equal distance between us. To be naked in his hotel room, I think you had to give up all your love for me. Otherwise, you couldn't cheat. And now you don't love me anymore, Tracy said sadly. No, I still love you. I guess I always will. But you can't forgive me. I don't know, Trace. Maybe I could if I really wanted to. But I'm not sure I want to. I can still see you in his room. You were naked except for your panties. Do you remember that? I remember this. I'm ashamed of myself. Maybe yes, maybe no. I have no way of knowing. But here's what I do know. I know how you feel when you sing on stage in front of a crowd. You're on fire. You want to be pounded into a mattress. You want it hard and fast, and you don't care who hears you scream. When I walked into that hotel room, you were leaning back on the bed, leaning on your elbows, and you were topless, and your nipples were very hard. Your legs were hanging over the bed, kind of spread apart. Do you remember what kind of panties you were wearing? Tracy nodded her head. Tears streamed down her face, and I could see her reliving that horrible night. She was wearing the emerald honey birdette set I'd given her for our anniversary. I've seen you in that emerald thong, and I know how turned on you get after a performance. In my mind's eye, I can see that thong soaked through and stuck to your cunt. I can smell your arousal filling that hotel room. God knows I've smelled that odor in my nostrils often enough. I can imagine how horny you were for him, waiting for him with your legs spread and your wet thong. So tell me, how do I overcome this? How do I get this image out of my head? How do I get this odor out of my nostrils? I stopped and looked at Tracy. Her eyes were wide with horror and she shook her head. No, no. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. We silently turned to walk back to her parents' house as she continued to shake her head and repeat to herself. No. No. Breakfast the next morning passed in silence. Everyone knew that Tracy and Coy had gone for a walk last night, and apparently it had not gone well, for Tracy looked sad and depressed when they returned to the house. The next morning the gifts were quickly unwrapped and spread out among the cars. Everyone hugged except Coy and Tracy, who avoided each other. Coy and Emma were the first to leave, followed by Coy's parents. Tracy retired to her room. There was a somber atmosphere in the house. Her parents could hear her crying and at one point wailing. They looked helplessly at each other. They were questioning the advisability of moving to Texas. Al thought it was a bad idea, but Tracy decided she would move anyway. Jean wanted to be there to support her daughter. Now they were here. They had a big house in Tyler, Texas, and now he owned a car dealership that he didn't want or need. Gee, 
The day after Christmas, Tracy met with her parents. I know you tried to be there for me while I was ruining my life. I appreciate that. I do. But I'm only causing everyone misery. I think it's time for me to leave. Maybe go to Europe or something. John gasped in shock. Her father, on the other hand, only rolled his eyes. Well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, Al said. You've had two years to deal with this shit and you couldn't. So the first time you have a heart-to-heart -heart talk and he doesn't get down on his knee and ask you to remarry, you're going to throw in the towel? Al shook his head and looked at Jean. Who was it? Who was Tracy's father? Jean looked at her husband in confusion. I'm serious. Someone other than me has to be her father. Because no child of mine would give up that easily. You're supposed to be messing with me, and I want to know who it was. Jean rolled her eyes. You've got me figured out. It was Larry, the guy from the package room in the condo building. Wait, Larry? The fat guy with the lazy eye? His eye wasn't so lazy, if you know what I mean. No, I have no idea. What does that even mean? His eye wasn't that lazy? Tracy watched her parents play. She realized they were joking. Her mother had never cheated on her husband. No, only she could cheat on her husband, not her mother. Al and Jean saw their daughter going through some thoughts in her head. Then Tracy looked at them with a slightly devious smile. I have an idea. It was New Year's Eve and Shooters had a festive atmosphere. Shooters is a golf-themed sports bar and grill that had autographed posters of famous PGA golfer shooter McGavin hanging all over the building. On normal evenings, the place was crowded. Today, however, it was packed to the elbow. Our little group was lucky. Al had a table reserved. None of our families were going to New Year's Eve parties. Instead, we went to shooters. Everyone except Tracy, who was still not feeling well, and Emma, who stayed the night with a high school friend whose Church of Christ parents weren't going to stay up late to celebrate the coming of another sinful year. I thought Emma's friend was a cutie, but her parents were a couple of tools. Karaoke? Is that why you brought me here? For karaoke? You know how I feel about karaoke. We're here because I was given a free pass to this place for tonight with a reserved table. You can't get anywhere else. It's New Year's Eve, it's 63 degrees outside, and every bar and restaurant in Tyler is packed to the gills. If we want to celebrate New Year's Eve, it's either that or booze at our house. I'm voting for here, my folks joined in. I rolled my eyes. Okay. Whatever. We had to endure many agonizing versions of Sweet Caroline, keep your hands to yourself, and friends in low places. That's the thing about karaoke. Everyone sings the same dozen or so songs and usually very badly. I looked at my watch, trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. We endured the cruel mockery of our eardrums for about 90 minutes when the familiar synthesizer intro to an old Bonnie Tyler song began. Then the singer began. Where have all the good people gone? Where are all the gods? Where's a street smart Hercules to fight the rising odds? Isn't there a white knight on a fiery horse? Late at night I toss and turn. And I dream of what I need. I need a hero. I'm waiting for the hero for the rest of the night. He must be strong. And it has to be fast. And he must be fresh from the fight. I need a hero. I'm waiting for a hero until the wee hours of the morning. He has to be sure. And it has to happen soon. And it has to be larger than life. Larger than life, uh, uh. I looked at my parents and former parents-in-law, who were avoiding my gaze by looking up, down, and around. Anywhere and everywhere but in my direction. When Tracy finished the song, the crowd broke into applause. Several people knew who she was because of the popularity of the school musical. This further solidified her in their eyes. When the song ended, Tracy addressed the audience. A few years ago, when I lived in Chicago, we used to sing karaoke with my husband a lot. There was one song we sang together. Then I was asked to join a band. Those of you who know who I am may not know this, but I am a born entertainer. I love performing in front of an audience and entertaining them. I love the applause, and I love being the center of attention. I started singing a song that was special to my husband, and I with the lead singer of that band. We became very popular. 
so popular that I lost sight of who I was and what was important to me. By this time, the noise of the crowd had died down, and it was as quiet as a church. Everyone was mesmerized as they listened to Tracy's speech. A confession. It didn't matter. I almost did the worst thing a wife can do to her husband. If my husband hadn't stopped me, I would have crossed a line beyond which there is no going back. He stopped me, but he couldn't forgive me and divorced me. The crowd murmured and Tracy raised her hand. No, he was right to divorce me. But I've lost my love of performing. This is the first time I've sung in front of an audience since the night my husband caught me thinking I was about to make a big mistake. But there is one song that makes me cringe. It was a song I used to sing with my husband. And now I've started singing it with someone else. The last time I heard this song was when I was riding in the car with my dad. I had a complete breakdown, and he had to turn the car around and drive me a hundred miles back to Chicago. Tracy took a deep breath. I turned my chair around and watched her. She looked in my direction. Coy, I have no right to ask you this, but could you sing it with me? For that matter, I want to be able to listen to the song without being committed to a mental institution. The announcer walked over and handed me the microphone. The crowd started applauding and I was left with only two options, one of which would make me a complete moron and probably get my ass kicked by the crowd. I stood up and started walking towards the stage as the intro began. It had been a few years since I had heard this song, but I still managed to start the opening line of the first part, Paradise, in time. I remember every little thing. It's like it just happened yesterday. Parking lot by the lake. And there wasn't a single car in sight. And I've never had a girlfriend. You look better than you did before. And all the kids at school? That night they dreamed of being in my shoes. And now our bodies are so close and tight. Never felt so good, never felt so right. And we shine like metal on a knife edge. Glittering like metal on a knife point. Come on! Hold on tight! Come on! Hold on tight! Tracy joined me in the next stanza, which was sung at a slower tempo. Though it is cold and lonely in the deep dark night, I can see heaven by the light on the dashboard. Then I moved on to the next verse. No doubt about it. We were doubly blessed. After all, we were barely 17. And we were barely dressed. No doubt about it. The toddler has to go and yell about it. No doubt about it. We were doubly blessed. After all, we were barely 17. And we were barely dressed. That night at Shooter's Bar and Grill, Tracy and I sang that song with more passion than ever before. Maybe it was contained emotion. Maybe it was a contained desire. I don't know what it was, but when we got to the second part, baseball broadcast, where I got to take on Phil Rizzuto's famous voice, Tracy was out of breath. I could smell her arousal. Her scent hung in the air. Her scent hung in the air at the shooter, but it wasn't in Riker's hotel room, despite my mind trying to convince me otherwise. When the third part, stop right there, began, a wild, almost feral look appeared in Tracy's eyes. It was a look I'd never seen before as she began to sing her part, shouting the first line loudly with a hard pause at the end, and then backtracking to the second line of the verse. Stop! I need to know right now! Before we go any further! Do you love me? Will you love me forever? Do you need me? You'll never leave me? Will you make me so happy for the rest of my life? Will you take me and make me your wife? Do you love me? Will you love me forever? You need me. You'll never leave me. You're going to make me happy for the rest of my life. Will you take me away and make me your wife? I need to know right now. Before we go any further, do you love me? Will you love me forever? I've seen videos of Mitloff singing this song with Carla DeVito, and I've seen him sing it with Ellen Foley, who sang it with him on the Bat Out of Hell album. But no one had ever sung it with as much passion and lust as Tracy did that night. When part four of Prayer for the End of Time ended, I finished the song. Never felt so good. It's never been more right. And we were glowing like metal on a knife edge. Never felt so good. It's never been more right. And we were glowing like metal on a knife edge. When we were done, I tossed my mic to the manager and grabbed Tracy's arm as she dropped her mic on the floor. 
I practically dragged her across the bar as she ran, trying to keep up with me. Our dad sat there in shock and our mom sat there with silly grins on their faces. Where are we going? She asked, climbing into the front seat of my pickup. My house, I growled, hitting the start button. Tracy nodded. She reached under her skirt, pulled her panties down her legs, and held them out to me. They were a light blue thong and they were soaking wet. No, the thongs in the hotel room in Milwaukee had never been like this. This one was slippery and shiny from her moisture. I brought them up to my face and inhaled her scent. Can't this truck go any faster? asked Tracy. When Emma came home from her sleepover, she wasn't surprised to see Tracy eating breakfast and wearing one of my t-shirts. Did you know I was set up? I asked my daughter. We promised we would have no secrets. No one told me anything. But I had a premonition. I didn't think she'd give up so easily. She didn't move to Texas to lay down and die. I just shook my head. It was hard to believe she was only eight. I'm really glad you're here. Good job, Daddy. And you too. Her voice broke off at the implicit question. I rolled my eyes. You can say it. You too, Mom, Emma said with a huge smile. Tracy knelt down and hugged Emma tightly. We're going to take our time, I said later. Emma went to bed and Tracy and I enjoyed a few more rounds of lovemaking. It had been almost three years for each of us. I expected Tracy to be flowing over the next few days. Definitely, she said, nodding her head in agreement. Very slowly. I just looked at her. You think you're going to move in with us today, don't you? Tracy nodded her head cheerfully. While you were in the shower, I called my mom to pack a suitcase for me. We still have some issues to work out. I don't trust you. We'll get counseling. And you have no reason to trust me. But you will. What about wanting to perform on stage and be the center of attention? I've recently discovered something about myself. That feeling I get when I direct a Christmas show? It was much more satisfying than the applause I received when I was on stage with the meltdown, just in a different way. Maybe it's a sign of maturity. Maybe I'm just getting older. Maybe I've realized what I've lost and I don't want to go through it anymore. Probably all three. Directing this musical is what my ego needs and I'll be happy with that. But does it turn me on? There's karaoke at Shooters a couple times a month, Tracy said with a sly grin. I nodded. We'll check it out. And we looked. Epilogue. Christmas one year later. The Connors were celebrating Christmas at the D'Amico's again. Coy's parents were sitting in the living room with cocktails when Coy and Emma walked through the front door. Right behind them walked Tracy, carrying three-month-old Bonnie in her arms. It had been so long since Coy and Tracy had made love, and they loved each other so much that they hadn't even thought about birth control on New Year's Eve. They looked at each other, shrugged, and came to a tacit agreement. Since it happened, it happened. And it certainly did happen. Bonnie, named after Bonnie Tyler, of course, was the quietest, happiest baby ever. The smartest and sweetest could also be added to that list. Emma adored her baby sister and couldn't take her eyes off her when she was brought home. She reminded Tracy and her father of their promise that Tracy would adopt her as soon as they had another baby. Coy explained that they had to get married first. Then the adoption would follow. Emma tapped herself on the wrist as if to say, time is running out. As both families sat down to dinner, last year's awkwardness was forgotten. Tracy shifted her gaze from Coy to Emma to Bonnie and then to her parents and future in-laws. She felt a wave of happiness wash over her. She didn't think she would ever be this happy again. She knew she didn't deserve it, but she grasped it with both hands and wouldn't let go. Merry Christmas. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel and watch for the next video.